Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's Iowa Arts Council Art Up. My name is Lisa Voges, and I'm the Community Development Manager with the Iowa Arts Council. The Arts Council, for those who are not familiar, is a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. We're your state arts agency, and we're pleased to present these art ups, which are learning opportunities for Iowa's artists, nonprofit organizations, and communities. Today, we're pleased to host our colleagues, Paula Moore, Cheryl Peterson, and Laura Sadowski from the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, Paula has directed the Local Government Preservation Program in Iowa since 2007, working with Iowa's 90-plus Historic Preservation Commissions. Previously, she has held preservation and curatorial positions at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the White House Old Executive Office Building, National Park Service, and the U.S. Treasury. Cheryl is a preservation specialist with the Iowa State Historic Preservation Office where she is a member of the review team for the State and Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentive Programs. She is a licensed architect with work that has included award-winning preservation projects. Before joining the Iowa State Historic Preservation Office, she worked in local government and historic preservation planning. And finally, Laura is the State Historian and National Register Coordinator at the State Historic Preservation Office. She is a graduate of the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Vermont and has worked previously as an um, architectural conservator at Shelburne Farms National Historic Landmark, a conservation coordinator at Salisbury House, and an architectural historian. The three of them will present to today's art up entitled Murals and Other Ways to Introduce Public Art into Your Historic Downtown, and they will address your questions at the end of the webinar. But before they get started, a few housekeeping items. All lines are currently muted and will be for the duration of the presentation to reduce background noise as this webinar is being recorded. The webinar will be archived on our website for future reference and we will send participants on today's webinar a link to the recording as well as their contact information which is at the end of the presentation. As mentioned, they will address your questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question, please feel free to use the chat feature on the left hand side of the screen. You may also use this feature if you are experiencing technical difficulties. Thank you again for joining us today, and now I will hand it over to Laura. Thank you, Lisa. All right, so welcome to the murals and other ways to introduce your public art into your historic downtown. So I'm going to talk about some issues with historic buildings and aesthetic considerations of murals, and then my colleagues will follow up with some discussion about technical aspects and ordinances and planning. So there really is no question that incorporating art into public spaces can have a dramatic impact on how both residents and visitors see your community. It enlivens the space, draws people together, shows people that this is a community that embraces and nurtures creativity, one that is alive, looks toward the future, and is very welcoming. But a lot of our traditional public gathering spaces are the same places as those that house our historic resources, those buildings that express the shared history of a community and speak to who we are at a very fundamental level. On the surface, the preservation of our historic buildings and downtown areas may seem at odds with the movement toward incorporating art into our public spaces, especially when it's on the buildings themselves. But with a little forethought and a lot of conversations and planning, Preservation and public art can not only live together quite harmoniously, but can support the efforts of the other as well. One thing to always keep in mind when you are contemplating murals in a community with historic buildings is that architecture itself is public art. The way a building was designed and how the materials were assembled represent an architect's artistic vision. It also expresses how the building owner hoped to be seen in the world. To erase or obscure important details is to erase the artistic expressions of past eras. Many of our historic downtowns and buildings in Iowa are listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This is essentially a list of historic buildings, structures, objects, sites, and districts that have been deemed worthy of preservation because of their associations to local, state, or national history. One requirement to be placed in the National Register is that a building or a district still has to retain those visual and aesthetic qualities that allow its history to be expressed. Design, the workmanship of artisans, materials used, general setting, and the feeling of history that is evoked are all important aspects of why a building or a district is considered historically significant and eligible for the National Register. 
This does not mean that there can be no change. It just means that it is important to be sensitive to the aesthetic qualities of historic buildings. We can certainly honor the artistic expressions of our predecessors and at the same time celebrate present day artists who work in a different medium. So the question is, how can we incorporate murals to respect the artistic vision of an architect from the past and preserve the key historic features of our buildings in downtown? And one way of being sensitive to the concerns of historic preservation is to consider placement. Obviously, first and foremost, the building owner should be willing and engaged with his or her building to ensure that it is in good condition, the latter of which my colleague Sherry will talk about in a few minutes. In general, however, you want to avoid the public facade or face of an historic building. So essentially, where your primary entrance is located, usually facing a street level. Um, this is where you're going to find the important architectural details that are the heart of the design. Placing murals here tends to overwhelm or distract from the design of the building, which frays or even severs the aesthetic links to its historic significance. Also be aware that in some cases, such as the building here off to the right, some buildings can have two public faces because they're, on, they're at the corner of two major intersecting streets. One of the most obvious sources for mural surfaces, however, are non-historic buildings, and usually most of our historic districts will have a few of these. These are often contemporary or modern buildings, but sometimes they are old buildings that have been changed so much that they can no longer convey their historic significance through their appearance. More modern buildings, especially, often have nice flat surfaces, not broken up by a lot of texture or architectural detailing, which could offer a really decent surface for an artist to work on. Other options include backs or sides of buildings. Usually, cost-conscious architects and their clients would not invest as much money and detail on secondary facades, so these walls are often plain or utilitarian in appearance. Because of this, they usually do not carry the weight of conveying the building's historic significance through its architecture. Because paint can have damaging effects on historically unpainted masonry, however, we do recommend avoiding these surfaces and sticking with already painted surfaces. With the sides of buildings, however, it is also important to pull that artwork back one bay or beyond a window that's on the side of the building so that it is not interfering with the visuals of the front of the building. And alleys are often really great places to consider putting murals. These are generally the size of buildings, as we just discussed, but I'm going to call them out here specifically because murals in these places tend to encourage the use of space by pedestrians, which can also make these spaces feel a little safer. Similarly, parking lots often face the backs or sides of buildings, but once again, these tend to be more utilitarian spaces, so they are not competing design-wise with historic architecture. Or if you have a parking garage, you might consider having artists paint inside the space. For visitors especially, this can serve as a great, vibrant welcome to the community right where they park their cars. And to follow up on the parking garage idea, consider other unexpected areas. Introducing the element of surprise can really delight both residents and visitors to the area. Underpasses offer a nice, large, blank, expanse of concrete, which are generally shaded from sunlight, so there's going to be less fading of colors, but there are some other technical aspects that can pose problems, which I know Sherry will talk about as well. And you might want to consider alternatives to wall murals as a way to introduce public art. A lot of these alternatives are a great way of increasing accessibility to artists who may not have access to the equipment needed for a large-scale wall project. They can also lend themselves better to projects involving the public in their creation. Sidewalks and public squares with large expanses of concrete can serve as excellent canvas for artists. Painting the risers, which is the vertical portion of the staircase, is another great option. Uh, but don't generally spend too much money on a project like this because it does doesn't really tend to last all that long, plus you should avoid, of course, painting any historic staircases. And it doesn't even have to be something that is permanently affixed to the streetscape. Park benches and movable forms in whatever meaningful shape you choose are also excellent options. These can be repainted on an annual basis and even repositioned at will around your city. 
The cows on the left are an annual project in Burlington, Vermont, a state well known for its cheese and, of course, the infamous Ben and Jerry's ice cream. <laughs> But with all these choices, it is important to plan how you're going to weave public art into your historic district in a way that feels balanced and still honors the buildings that represent your community's origins. Too many murals in one location, for example, can be an overstimulation for visitors and residents, as well as greatly impact the visuals of an historic district. Casinos are well known for their bright colors, overwhelming amounts of patterns, and flashing lights and you really want your visitors and residents to feel at ease in these public spaces so that they will linger and enjoy all the amenities that your community might offer. Some people might also be concerned about content or ensuring that a particular aesthetic honors their community. So seeking public comment and starting the conversation early is always advisable so that residents can feel as though they are part of the conversation. One way to provide some oversight of content while also generating excitement in your community is to hold a competition. Determine where you would like the mural to go, how big it should be, how it should be applied, and with what materials. You might also want to consider a theme, celebration for, of local history, for example. Forming a selection committee for this will be important. Local residents and city or community leaders should have representation, but also consider including artists as well. They, of course, would not be able to submit a proposal, but they would be able to offer expertise in evaluating the installation of proposed work, as well as the visual and design aspects. Another way of soliciting proposals for mural or any other public art is to put out a request for qualifications, or RFQ. With this tactic, artists will submit examples of their previous work to you so that you can select possible artists based upon their personal styles. Then you can provide a nominal sum to selected artists to develop a concept for your mural. This may seem like an unnecessary investment, but it will honor both your time in ensuring that you only review proposals from artists whose aesthetic fits with yours, as well as the artist's time in developing a proposal specific to your project. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Sherry, who will tell you more about the technical considerations of murals on buildings. Okay, thank you, Laura. For technical aspects, uh, advanced slide. It didn't work with the. Just click on the. Okay. For technical aspects, I'm going to talk about best practices for painted murals, with a specific focus on historic masonry buildings. I think old brick buildings are at the heart of every Iowa town, and this is where you see so much enthusiasm for installing murals. As Laura has advised, a mural should not be located on the front or primary elevation of any historic building, but it may be appropriate on the side or back of certain building types. What we often find on the secondary side and back elevations of historic masonry buildings are plain brick walls or maybe clay tile or concrete block. The front of the building will have the best materials and the secondary elevations will, be, will have less expensive and less durable materials. Because these secondary elevations were built with less durable materials, it is not unusual for the masonry to be painted or covered with parging or stucco. If the wall is not painted or parged, and especially if it has original stone, ornamental brick, or terracotta, then we recommend finding another location for the mural. In this case, protecting the architecture, the building's historic character and integrity would be the first priority. Um, I'd also like to say that any mural located on the side of a historic building should be held back a measurable distance from the front corner of the building, and that would be the like a full structural bay on larger buildings and possibly less on smaller buildings. So within those parameters, what are other considerations when selecting the location for a mural? I'm starting with wall selection and I want to say from the beginning that I'm summarizing guidance provided by the American Institute for Conservation and a public murals program that they had a few years ago. Uh, vandalism is a consideration. Will the location require extra security or maintenance? Orientation, what direction is the wall facing? 
If the wall is exposed to direct sunlight for much of the day, the mural will fade and deteriorate more quickly. Exposure to pollutants. If the location is exposed to high levels of vehicular traffic, such as the underpass, exhaust and other dirt and pollutants will accelerate mural deterioration. Building use. Is the building occupied? Commercial kitchens, industrial or manufacturing functions, or the more typical heating, air conditioning, bathrooms and kitchens of residential occupancy can cause the mural or cause the wall to fluctuate in temperature and or humidity, which will affect how well the paint adheres to the wall. Moisture and water problems. I think it is good advice to, to ins inspect the wall during rain and immediately after heavy rain. Ideally, the top of the wall will have eaves, flashing, or a cap that prevents water from streaming down the face of the wall. Also observe how quickly the wall dries. You may have a problem with rising damp if the wall is damp during periods when it's not rainy. Look for staining, streaking, or salt on the wall, which are signs of previous or ongoing moisture problems. Again, these factors will affect paint adhesion. The top of the wall at the parapet and the base of the wall at the ground are the areas most likely to show moisture problems. Uh, and in addition to moisture problems, the wall should be inspected for masonry deterioration and structural problems. Loose stucco, missing brick, crumbling mortar, and structural instability such as bowing and cracking, these are problems that must be corrected before starting a mural. As a precaution, we recommend consulting with an architect, engineer, experienced contractor, or other expert to have the wall analyzed. Once you've selected a location and made any necessary repairs, the wall has been cleaned, and once the wall is clean and dry, you're ready for the artist, who is typically responsible for the priming, painting, and coating. Considerations we want to uh, point out include surface preparation. The wall is cleaned to remove surface dirt or salt, debris, and vegetation. Here we direct you to preservation brief number one from the National Park Service, and there'll be a link at the end. Um, for best practices when cleaning historic masonry, and preservation brief number six for advice on, a, on abrasive cleaning. Always start with the gentlest means possible, and only use power washing, sanding, and wire brushing if a test in a small area of the wall indicates that the technique is non-damaging, and never sandblast. There are limits to what an old wall can withstand you want to avoid damage and maintain a solid substrate for the new mural. Vapor permeability. It's normal for water vapor to move in and out through the exterior walls of historic masonry buildings. In an occupied building in Iowa, the direction of that movement changes with the season, but the wall is always breathing. For this reason, the primer, paint, and coating products should not create a vapor barrier. Trapping this moisture in the wall can cause damage to the wall and accelerate deterioration of the mural. Product compatibility. Consider using the same manufacturer and product line for the primer, the paint, and the top coating to avoid adverse reactions and to protect the paint layer as much as possible. Murals painted with compatible products are less prone to flaking, bubbling, and fading. Artist paints. Uh, the paint product I see referenced for mural painting is Nova Color, uh, an acrylic paint. Other types of paint products such as architectural paints, marine type coatings, spray paint, or old-fashioned oil-based sign paint may be more difficult to research and their suitability for use on historic masonry may be more prone or may be more difficult to determine. Mineral paint may be the best choice, although unfamiliarity and initial cost may be prohibitive. And finally, testing. Always follow the manufacturer's directions for primer paint and coating products and test the product before use in a small area. Above the wall.
and this leads to documentation. In general, you should expect to keep photographic and written records throughout the life of the mural with copies of this information provided to the appropriate, appropriate stakeholders. Keep a photographic record of the wall before, during, and after each step in the preparation and painting of the mural and record the dates of your photographs. Uh, photograph the wall before any work has started and photograph any repairs. Photograph the clean wall and of course make photographs during the painting of the mural. Continue this photographic record to document tests, maintenance, and repairs over time. Also keep written documentation from initial wall preparation through mural painting and maintenance. Keep written descriptions and dates of all work performed. And from beginning to end, keep a record of all product selections, along with copies of the manufacturer's product literature. All of this documentation will be useful if problems develop with the wall, if the mural needs to be retouched or repainted, and to keep track of regular maintenance. I've also listed contracts and agreements, and of course, legal documents will be kept with the mural records, as well as reports prepared by the artist or any consultants. Um, so maintenance and the eventual removal of the mural. Uh, getting ready for this presentation, it was amazing how many images I could find of beautiful murals. Not so easy finding pictures of faded, peeling, or vandalized murals, but we know they're out there. The best advice is careful planning, appropriate methods, good quality products, and a budget for maintenance. Maintenance activities may include removing or trimming vegetation, removing surface dirt, removing graffiti, and reapplying the top coating. So set a schedule for regular inspection of the mural. Ideally, this should be twice a year, once after the winter and once after the summer, the two times of year with the most weather extremes. Scheduled checks of a large mural, scheduled checks of a large mural may be done with the aid of binoculars, but depending on the mural's condition, every three to five years it may be advisable to examine it using lifts or scaffolding. Uh, periodic cleaning. Any washing of the mural should be done as gently as possible without detergents and with minimal water pressure. Instructions from the artist should be documented and always test a small area before beginning any cleaning project. Uh, Touch-ups and recoating. Be prepared for damage and deterioration of the paint and top coat. Reference your mural documentation to match original products and know that graffiti removal is a significant maintenance concern. One function of the clear top coating is to aid in graffiti removal. The coating is the sacrificial barrier between graffiti and the paint layer. Select a compatible coating that can be removed without damaging the underlying paint. Set up graffiti samples to test the coating product and the cleaning solvents. If possible, conduct these tests over a series of weeks to see how, different, how difficult it is to remove various media after it has set in. It's also good advice to leave a small area of the mural uncoated, mark and photograph this area. You will then know by comparison if the coating is clouding, yellowing, or failing over time. Deciding the intended lifespan of the mural will be part of the initial planning process, as well as prescribing methods for eventual removal or cover-up. We consider it appropriate to paint over a mural that was created on a previously painted historic masonry wall. Again, careful surface preparation, product compatibility, and testing are recommended. And Conservation, restoring a mural rather than covering or otherwise removing it may require the services of professional conservators. And if your mural becomes famous and worth a lot of money, then you may need attorneys and security as well. Uh, finally, I uh, want to list a few alternatives to painted murals. Installing wood, metal, or plastic panels may be a good option. 
Of course, compared to a mural painted on a wall, there are different considerations and precautions. We, defi we definitely recommend hiring a professional to design the support and attachment system. An important detail is the placement of anchors. For historic masonry walls, anchors should be installed in the mortar joints to avoid drilling holes in the historic brick, tile, or concrete. When the, artwork, when the artwork is eventually removed, the mortar can be easily repaired while damage to masonry units is permanent. Uh, Non-woven media. A common product name is Polytab. This is a lightweight fabric that the artist can prep and paint in the studio and then deliver to the site, where it is then adhered to the cleaned and primed wall. This allows the artist to do most of the work in the studio, minimizing the time spent on site. It is also safer for volunteers who can participate in the mural painting without the risk of working in lift equipment or on scaffolding. Applied films, the ones I've seen are 3M products. Over masonry walls in good condition, applied films can last a couple years and can be fairly easily removed. Perforated film is used for glass applications to allow visibility. Think of applied films as temporary murals. And finally, um, projected images. Uh, this is an alternative that should leave no mark on the building. The projected art can be a one-time event or the equipment can be installed more permanently and last for months or years. Turn it over to Paula. Okay, well, thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Laura. Um, so, uh, just to recap a little bit, um, Laura has talked about the historical and aesthetic considerations when planning your mural program, and Sherry has talked about the technical aspects um, with an emphasis on making sure that no harm is done to your historic building or your historic district. Um, my part of this presentation is to talk about how you can integrate these issues into an ordinance that is passed by your city council. Um, a well-written ordinance will help um, your city manage the program so that it is an asset and helps to achieve your community's goal for artistic expression. So this um, is a mural that um, is in Los Angeles, and um, Los Angeles is really a hotbed for um, uh, public um, murals, and uh, they, in the past few years, have uh, passed an ordinance themselves for their own pr uh, program. Um, let's see, that is not working, is it? There we go. Maybe I just need to go up here. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so, um, an ordinance codifies or puts into words um, a program that is fair, enforceable, and understandable for all the stakeholders. Um, stakeholders for your mural program include the public, artists, and property owners. Um, another way to think about this is that a good ordinance answers the why, what, who, where, when, and how questions of a mural program. So your ordinance should begin with a statement that succinctly expresses the purpose and the goal of the program. Uh, that is the why question. Um, so you'll want to craft a statement that answers the question why your town has a mural program. Um, think about this as an introductory statement um, that explains the mission or vision for your mural program. And you can find um, all sorts of examples in other cities' ordinances. Um, here's an example of one that um, I found, and I, I did edit it a little bit, um, but it could read, murals are an important part of cultural expression in Smithville, connecting our residents and visitors with our past and enriching their lives. Ordinances also typically have a definition section, and here you would want to define what your city means by a mural. An example of a definition might be, a mural is generally described as a one-of-a-kind image that does not contain any commercial message on an exterior surface of a building, structure, fence, or garden wall. So you can see that with this de definition, you are documenting what is a mural and what is not a mural. 
And I wanted to talk um, a little bit about um, commercial messages. Um, so an, uh, an artistic mural is not an advertisement um, or a commercial. A commercial message is one that advertises a business, um, service, or good produced or sold. Instead, your mural program is about artistic enrichment by highlighting your community's history and creating a place that is artistically vibrant. So um, one of the important steps um, in um, one of the important steps in um, uh, planning your mural program and drafting your ordinance is to think holistically um, about your community. And um, so you'll want to um, sit down with a map and figure out um, where are your non-historic buildings, where are your historic buildings, um, where are um, historic walls that, um, I'm sorry, I need to go back a little bit here. I skipped a slide. Um, so, one of the important steps in planning your mural program and drafting your ordinance is to think holistically about your community. Um, so sitting down with um, a map of your town is really critical. Um, even better um, is to walk or drive your town. Um, this is a good way to understand what part of your town is appropriate for murals. Um, it will also help you understand within that area what buildings are suited um, for murals and which ones are not. Um, I often uh, suggest this exercise to local preservationists, that they systematically drive or walk their town. And they usually report back to me that this is an eye-opening exercise, and they see things in their town that they never noticed before. So I think this would be a valuable exercise for you, too, and will help you understand where murals can be placed to achieve the goals of your program. Um, as Laura um, mentioned, you also need to know what is listed on your national register and have those buildings um, in those historic districts located on a map. And you probably are going to limit your mural program uh, to your downtown, and that needs to be specified in your ordinance. All right. Um, so as Laura talked, um, we recommend that you do not allow murals on the fronts or public faces of buildings. You will also want to avoid painting murals on historic buildings and on walls that have never been painted. So your ordinance needs to spell out those restrictions. Again, knowing your building stock can help you, I help you specify what is appropriate in your community. Um, it's also a good idea to specify maximum size um, so that um, the murals that are created in your community um, are appropriate for the scale of your downtown and its building stock. Uh, size limitations can be expressed in terms of percentage of the wall surface um, or an overall size limitation. Uh, your ordinance should also dictate or indicate um, which uh, techniques are approved uh, directly on the wall, mechanically attached to the wall, if the mural is mechanically attached, how will it be done? And as, as um, Sherry has uh, discussed, um, if you're attaching through a brick wall, you want to make sure that those fasteners are done through the mortar joint. Um, identify acceptable materials um, without using trade names. Um, are there paints that you want to prohibit, such as um, fluorescent paint or neon paint? Uh, will you allow lettering? Um, if so, how much? Will you allow the mural to be illuminated at night? Um, this is one area where you might want to look at your sign ordinance because there may be some guidance there already. Okay, another thing to think about is um, the duration of your mural. Um, will the mural stay up indefinitely um, or is your program intended to be one of changing murals? or perhaps you will allow both temporary and permanent murals. But regardless, uh, your ordinance should address this. Okay, um, and then maintenance. Uh, your ordinance should also spell out who is responsible for maintenance of the mural. Uh, in the unfor an unfortunate event that there's graffiti, who is responsible for removing the graffiti? And how quickly must it be removed? who is responsible for keeping the mural in good repair. Uh, your ordinance should also provide some details about the application process. Um, the ordinance should reference the application itself and that a complete application is required. And here the objective is 
is to make sure that whatever body you set up um, to review the mural applications, they have all the information that they need to understand the proposed project and to evaluate whether it is allowed under your ordinance. If pieces of the application are missing, you'll want to be able to table the application, ask, asking the applicant to provide those missing pieces of information. Uh, the other thing that your ordinance should um, indicate is who reviews the applications. Um, I think ideally you should have a board or a commission that has members representing a variety of stakeholders. Those stakeholders could include the public, business owners, historic preservation commission members, your planning commission, historical society, and certainly someone from the local art community. Um, how quickly will the application be reviewed? Um, typically, a 30-day uh, review period is reasonable. So uh, that body that reviews the applications will need to have a regular meeting schedule so that they can respond to applications within the, the time frame specified in the ordinance. And then what if a review body denies um, approval for the mural? Uh, what body does the applicant appeal to? So that's something to consider too, as part of your ordinance. Okay, now we don't recommend that you um, actually list the parts of the application in the ordinance. Um, in the future, you may want to make changes to the, the application itself. And so if the parts are actually listed in your ordinance, um, you'll need to take the ordinance back to a city council to get approval for those changes. So instead, I think it's um, sufficient to state um, in your ordinance that a complete application is required. But here are some of the pieces um, that you'll want to collect in order to review the proposal. Um, obviously, you'll need some contact information. You'll want specific details on the proposed mural, such as the location, size, materials, and the technique. The application should include photographs of the building and the elevation where the mural will be placed. If the applicant is not the owner of the building, uh, then a letter from the owner giving permission should also be attached. Uh, the applicant should provide information about the schedule of the execution of the mural. Um, you'll want some assurance that the mural will be completed in a reasonable period of time. Um, is there staging or rigging required? Um, what are the details of that? Um, you'll also want proof of insurance. Um, so here you'll want ass assurance that in the event of an accident, um, there is insurance to coverage, uh, cover the accident. Um, many downtown um, buildings have utilities mounted on exterior walls, and so the applicant may need to coordinate the, the work of the mural with local utilities to make sure that there's no interruption of service and that there are no safety concerns. Um, and then finally, you'll want some visual representation so that you can understand what the finished mural will look like. You'll also want some information about the artist so that you have confidence that the project can be carried out successfully. And then um, our last slide is um, a very short list of um, some references that um, may be useful to you as you plan your own program. Uh, Sherry talked about the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, these are standards and guidelines that um, we use in historic preservation for a lot of our um, grant programs and historic tax credit um, projects, and so there's some really good guidance there. Um, drilling down a little deeper, um, there are preservation briefs, and Sherry also mentioned these in her part of the presentation. Uh, these are developed by the National Park Service, and they're very well um, written and illustrated. Uh, tutorials on a various uh, variety of preservation topics. Um, the mural uh, creation best practices document uh, was developed by the American Institute for Conservation. And this document discusses everything from planning to maintenance. And Sherry uh, mentioned this in her um, talk. And then finally is the Visual Artist Rights Act of 1990, um, which we haven't talked about. But it does discuss um, the important topic of um, the rights of artists and their work. Um, so when you see this um, PowerPoint, when it's sent to you, you will not be able to click on these links, I don't believe. But we will send them out separately in an email so that um, you will be able to activate those links. So I think at this point, we um, are ready to open up the floor to questions and comments that you might have. Thank you for comments.
be a session connected to New York? So um, the question that we have is, I think, how did deaccession um, a mural? Was that correct? Um, I think I have that question correct. Um, so deaccessioning is something that we usually think of in terms of a museum collection. Um, so, you know, if you have an existing mural and, and the question is how do you remove it from your program, I, I guess, uh, is the question. Um, I think I think the mural is probably the property of the building owner itself, and so it would be a conversation that you would want to have with the building owner is what I would say. And I'm sorry if we are misunderstanding the question. Okay. Um, we have another comment here. Um, I think small communities are always interested in sources of funding and grants. So is that something that you would like to address, Lisa? Sure. Um, we, I, I don't know if, Joan, if you are um, signed up for our, um, our newsletter that comes out twice monthly, but we're always listing different grant resources there. We actually, at the Iowa Arts Council, have an art project grant, which can fund murals. Um, those are definitely murals that have a real community element, so either community input or community um, kind of process. Um, as part of that application. Um, and we also list other grant opportunities in our newsletters as they come available. Um, we also list those on our website calendar, so I would be aware of those options as well. Um, I will say that most funding is tied to that real public input element, so keep that in mind as you are looking for um, kind of public funding. And you can always look, we have a lot of communities that do kind of uh, private-public partnerships. If it's a priority of the city or the community, they might have some funding towards it. Also, um, business owners really like having murals as well, so they are often willing to put up some of the funding as well. So I would recommend also looking um, internally when you're considering funding and grants. Okay, so we have another question here. Do you have any advice on gaining consensus from the community on a public art piece? Do you want me to talk on that one? <laughs> 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 um, okay, so that is again why it's really important to have a committee set up beforehand, to have a panel of um, both community members and experts in the field. Um, often it's advised to maybe have those be from outside of the community. Um, when they're doing kind of the um, review process of the different pieces that are submitted. Um, but as far as kind of determining um, what content is maybe allowed, I would definitely encourage you to keep that in your policy, um, as Paula talked about, because obviously you might want to make sure that there's nothing vulgar um, or offensive or political. So all of that should be included so that it's not even considered from the very beginning as something that is submitted um, as a potential mural. Um, again, I, I want to mention that you can never really please anyone with art, um, so your goal should never necessarily be everyone, but just have a process in place that you can fall back on that's really clear and transparent from the very beginning as far as your selection process. And I believe we do have guidelines on um, our website about that. Um, I'd also, and this is a little precursor, we also have another art up coming up in, um, on March 4th that talks about community art. So I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But I'd recommend making sure you kind of um, make sure the community is involved and that you have those community members on the panel from the beginning. Um, and I will answer the next one too, which again is content of a mural. <laughs> who decides, um, likewise, who decides if an artist's talents are up to the task. Um, and that is all part of kind of when you um, post a call for artists, you should include um, those elements. There are tons of examples online for different calls. You can actually also go on our website and see current calls for artists that are posted. And a lot of those include um, kind of making sure that an artist has experience in doing murals so that you can actually see what work they've done in the past. Um, and then as part of kind of setting up your, um, your process for reviewing and selecting your mural or any public art, 
um, you should contain those content elements, um, as I mentioned before, making sure there's nothing vulgar or political or anything like that. That should be put in your guidelines from the beginning um, as kind of a, a ground level review. Um, and then otherwise, I mean, content of mural is really wide open. That's the whole point of art is to kind of make it big and wide open. So just make sure you have a panel of um, mixture of experts and community representatives um, on your selection and you should have a piece that you're really excited about. So um, the other question is about how should we approach rear facade windows that have been filled in? Is this an appropriate space for a mural? Sherry? It would seem to be. We've talked about putting these on mm -hmm. the back. Um, the, the question I would have is what's the window filled in with? Mm -hmm. um, the masonry uh, infill is, is going to have a more permanent surface. You know, if it's infilled with wood, I don't think it, you know, it's a different technique and it may not last as long. Mm -hmm. But you're probably not looking for something that lasts a long time with that location. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, um, the next question is about preservation brief number two. And that's about um, taking care of a masonry wall and uh, in particular repointing or tuck pointing. And yes, I thought about that. You may, you may need to repoint the whole wall before you're ready to start the mural. Okay, um, do you have samples of ordinances that can be shared with us? Um, well, I'm, I mentioned early in my presentation that um, Los Angeles has a mural ordinance, and if you, if you Google mu uh, mural ordinance, it will come up with um, a number of choices from across the country. There's a program up in uh, Washington State, a uh, town there that has an, a program and an ordinance. Um, so I, I'd recommend that you just um, uh, get online and do some Googling and uh, you can find how other communities have approached their ordinance. Uh, what about ensuring long-term maintenance of the mural and or what happens when the masonry needs maintenance? Well, um, planning ahead so that you have a stable wall before you place the, the mural. But um, you know, it, murals get touched up and even repainted. So if you have to take a part of the wall out and do maintenance, mm -hmm. then that's where you want to keep records of the design, the colors and paint products used, everything that was part of the original creation so that you can recreate it if you have to go in and do actual maintenance to the wall. Mm -hmm. And I would think in any agreement that you have with an artist that there's going to be some agreement as to who's going to be responsible for maintenance long term as well. Right. Something like that would be way right. beyond an artist's <laughs> right, right. responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you discouraging murals on the fronts of buildings? Um, what about uh, the, in the case of a corner lot? Well, for like I mentioned in my part of the presentation, if it's an historic building, we do discourage murals on the front because it really does distract from the architectural detailing that made that building historic and uh, eligible for listing in the National Register or with an historic district. And with cor buildings that occupy corner lots, a lot of times if you if you rem recall, there was that building on one of my beginning slides that had the mural that, that uh, went from one side of the building, crossed the corner, and enveloped around the other side. Buildings like that that have basically two, two front faces, we do want to avoid putting murals there as well. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, you know, determine whether or not it's appropriate for a building that happens to be on a corner uh, but doesn't have that sort of second public face that you would expect for a primary entrance, that it would really be, you know, a case-by-case -case basis whether or not it's appropriate. You know, if it's, you know, unpainted masonry, of course, we would recommend that you never paint unpainted masonry just to protect the, the historic materials. Sometimes, so you lose your neighboring building and so you have that exposed sure. side. Mm -hmm. And that's when we're saying don't run the mural all the way up to the front corner of the 
of the historic building. You mm -hmm. pulled it back. Um, how do you address ghost signs in the mural ordinance? Well, that's a really good question, and, and ghost signs are wonderful, um, and you're very lucky if you have one in your historic downtown. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the paint they used for those ghost signs were, but it seems to be pretty durable in some cases, and those, those murals are still legible. So, you know, so maybe an instance where you just want to leave it alone, that you don't want to mm -hmm. do any sort of treatment, and um, it's, it's been there for decades, if not a hundred years, and just leave it be. It's earned its place, <laughs> and we recommend not, not touching those up. Right. Usually in most community city ordinances, um, you're kind of grandfathered in if you already exist. So I'm assuming that would be the case with a new mural ordinance for a community. Um, anything that is currently existing would not necessarily have to comply to that existing ordinance. So the fact that that ghost sign existed, it would not be an issue. Okay, um, will we lose our historic designation if a mural goes on one of the key buildings on the side facing the street? So th this is, is going to be a very similar answer to, as to a couple questions before. It, you know, if you're talking about a, a, a side of the building that's not really your primary front entrance that has most of your architectural detailing, um, not necessarily. It really depends upon the reason why that building is considered historic, you know, what its character defining features are. Once again, it's another case by case basis. So there is, isn't really a good general rule of thumb. And also, we're, we're sort of implying that these are your Main Street kind of commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. If it's a monumental building in town, if it's your Carnegie Library or uh, you know, a, a significant school or post office, then we really would say no mural. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do mural regulations, guidelines, and ordinances hold up to a free speech challenge? Um, for instance, I want my expression on the primary facade <laughs> despite the ordinance. <laughs> Well, as, as I was doing some of the research for this presentation, I, I could see that um, that issue has come up, that um, people have pushed that point. Um, I decided not to delve into it very much because I'm not an attorney. Um, but I think this, this also gets at what uh, Liesl said earlier, is that you want to make sure that you have um, a body to review these um, murals that's really representative of your community, and that it's an open process, and that the public also has a chance um, to, to weigh in and offer their input. Um, but, but certainly, if you think that um, a free speech challenge is a possibility in your community, I would recommend talking with your city attorney and see if they could give you some um, guidance on that. Um, is city approval always required for murals or does it depend on your city's ordinances? Um, yeah, I think a, a place to start would be to see what your city already has um, on the books. Um, so, for example, your downtown may already be a local historic district and that there are some, some guidelines about what property owners can do to the exterior of their building and what they can't. Um, I think one of the values of um, having an ordinance is that it's a way to articulate to the public and to the property owners, um, this is what we value. and. Um, these, this is the structure for the mural program as we're going to run it um, in our community. And keep in mind, when you're in the process of developing the ordinance, um, there, there's plenty of opportunity for the public to have input in the creation of that ordinance, too. Um, at a minimum, the ordinance is going to be read um, by your city council three times, and you may um, very well have some public hearings before it even gets to city council for their consideration. Um, how do you find is the best way to receive feedback from the public on the content artist for the mural? We honestly 
don't have a lot of communities that do it that way. Um, and I think that's just because opening wide open is when you have more of an opportunity for people to give um, very negative feedback. So we do kind of recommend more of a, a small panel of experts um, and those kind of community representatives compared to a, um, um, a kind of ad hoc where anyone can give their feedback on anything. Um, so I, I would say if you're dead set and you think that's going to be the best method for your community is to have a panel that maybe narrows the options down to just kind of a top few um, and then get votes in whatever way makes sense for you, whether that's post pictures of them in your community library or city hall and just give like, you know, little pieces of corn in jars and everyone votes, like whatever makes the most sense for you. But I would definitely recommend having an initial process to kind of narrow down the scope before um, just kind of opening it up to the full public. I think we've come to the end of the question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys have any last feedback? Those were all really good questions, so um, thank you for asking them and uh, drawing out some other nuances about murals in your downtown. Yes, well, thank you guys so much um, for taking your time to present today and for answering all the questions, and thank you everyone who joined on the webinar for participating. We appreciate it. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar and the contact information um, shortly. And there will also be a brief survey included on the email that you can fill out and let us know what you thought of today's webinar and also give us the opportunity to tell us what other kinds of art ups um, you would like to see us host in the future. Um, and I would, I kind of gave a teaser on this earlier, but I'd like to invite you to join us for our final winter art up, which actually builds upon today's topic. Um, next up, we will host Jennifer Drinkwater with Iowa State University for a discussion on how to work better with your local artists and why they are so important to your community and for community art. And that will be on March 14th, um, also at 2 p.m. Registration information is available on our website at iowaculture.gov slash art. Um, and you can also view on the website other recordings of archived art ups over the past years um, there as well. So thank you again very much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.